I'm Drew Harwell. I'm a national tech reporter for The Washington Post, um, covering AI and big data. And I am very honored to welcome Peggy Johnson. She's an executive vice president for business development at Microsoft, um, which is a company that's been thinking about this for a long time. Bill Gates has been talking about AI research for probably 25 years 25 now. 25 years, yeah. Um, so uh, we just want to talk a little bit uh, with, with Peggy. She oversees the investments through Microsoft's venture capital arm, which has invested millions in AI and other startups. She's also an engineer. Before this, she spent 24 years at Qualcomm, which has also been in the news for different reasons. There's also a book out in the lobby um, that Microsoft did called The Future Computed Artificial Intelligence and Its Role in Society. It's very good and very smart. And I've also been told that before we get started, I'd like to remind our audience that you can tweet your questions using the hashtag transformers. So make them good. Um, so let's begin. Uh, Microsoft has been thinking about this for a long time. Um, where are we at now in AI? Uh, where's the research? Where's the development? And how is it sort of affecting people's lives? Right. So I think you know a lot of people think AI is a new trend. It's actually been around for quite some time. Um, Bill Gates, about 25 years ago, when he was starting Microsoft Research, um, sort of had this uh, prediction back then. He said, someday uh, computers are going to be able to see us, hear us, talk to us, understand us. And it was quite prescient because now we're coming to that point where they are. And um, I, I think the reason it's now top of mind is a, a, lot of, um, a lot of trends have all converged. So the idea of cloud computing, big data, AI algorithms, you mix all those together and now we have some momentum behind it and we're starting to see real impact. Mm -hmm. Are they really understanding us, though? Or help us understand they're, they're hearing us. There's voice recognition. There's facial recognition. But what are the limits now? I mean, are they really sort of comprehending like a human would? Or? Well, it's interesting. Um, for a long time, it seemed that that was a very hard problem to solve, voice recognition, uh, image recognition. But over the last few years, that's really accelerated. And now, both of those actually are cognitive services that we have that have both voice and image recognition um, are testing out better than human uh, voice recognition and human image recognition slightly better. So we're now at the point where this is a tool now that we can put into place for a number of, of good uses. Um, so it, it is real and it is starting to have some early impact in the space. Mm -hmm. Great. I want to riff off a little bit of what Tony was talking about, sure. this issue of bias and this issue of things getting baked into the system. We know that AI depends on data and compute power, and if the data is biased, there's going to be issues in the compute and in the product. So um, from the company side and from the research side, how do you all think about um, you know, paving over those issues, trying to make as fair and equitable of an AI product as possible? Right. So it's important to think about it, and we do. We take it very, very seriously. Um, but if you just imagine a pool of data, and that data is now going to be used to train an AI algorithm, there's no pool of data that's perfect, right? And so, um, and particularly when you start to talk about uh, social Im impact and, and social uses of it, you want to make sure that that data is the best data possible. Um, and you want to make sure that you go into it knowing there's going to be some bias in the data, which is why you still want to have humans involved in the equation. So for instance, you mentioned I'm an engineer. So let's say we had an AI algorithm that we wanted to train to find us the most successful engineering candidates. I'm getting ready to start a company. I need the best engineers. I might say, let me, let me search back in the pool of data that I have on engineers and let me try and find what will be the attributes that would make the most successful engineers. So I might look at skills, at training, that sorts of thing, those sorts of things. But one thing that that data would show is it's mostly men. I know, because I grew up in that industry. Uh, my, my university, most of, the, most of the time I was the only woman in the room when I was, uh, when I was practicing engineering. So if we just relied on the data, we would input that data into the algorithm. The algorithm would say successful engineers are men. 
And we know that's not the case for a whole number of reasons. Uh, we know we're starting to understand more why the, there is this gender gap in engineering. But if you solely relied on the data, you would introduce a bias, and then you would amplify the bias. Because on the other end, you say, well, this is what the computer says. The computer says successful engineers are men. Those are the sorts of things we have to take the utmost care in and ensure that we have a human involved in that equation who understands, well, this data might be slightly tainted. Yeah, and I find that part of it really fascinating, the idea that you could solve these problems of sort of recruitment bias and that sort of thing with the computer. But um, having the human oversight there, what does that provide us and how, do, how can we keep that part of it in check? I mean, uh, what, what sort of guidelines would you put in oversight of the kind of human moderator in the process? Right, so we definitely need to deploy this technology responsibly. And a couple years ago, about mid-2016, our CEO, Satya Nadella, who had been thinking about this, introduced a set of principles. And he said, as we develop this technology, we need to ensure that we have protections in place for things like fairness, um, safety, security, transparency, accountability. You heard that the senators bring up accountability, privacy, inclusiveness. All of these things have to be things you think about as you're training these algorithms. And you have to do so um, with a core of empathy. And, and you have to ensure that as you're training the algorithms, you're doing so with dignity. Because again, as, as you said, you know, you could, we could be using these um, algorithms to help us find the best candidates for jobs, or maybe to accurately diagnose a medical um, ailment. And, uh, or maybe even to get a loan. And we want to ensure that we have those sorts of protections in place so that uh, the algorithm doesn't spit out an answer that you just take as the final answer. Mm -hmm. you, you have to always balance it with, um, with those protections. Yeah. Empathy in the product, yeah. empathy in the science, I find that really fascinating. I, I think AI especially, maybe it's all the science fiction and Skynet movies and that sort of thing, but like it feels like that's an important part of the development. And they, even in the book they talk about maybe there should be a Hippocratic Oath for AI developers and engineers. What would that look like? Um, and are engineers thinking about that right now, thinking about the human side of the equation? We are, and we think very carefully when we begin to build our AI teams. We want to ensure that the teams look like the population, because again, that's a way that you can introduce bias. If it was a team full of Peggy Johnsons, it would be the best product for Peggy Johnson, but maybe not for you or anybody else in the room. So you have to, you have, to have this element of, of empathy in, in that equation, but really, at its core, AI is a tool. I think we're, you know, we're, we're talking so much about all the good it can do and, and you know, could it be a doomsday device as well. There's sort of, there's sort of uh, arguments on both ends. I think of it as a tool. And you know, in a very simplistic form, the way a, a wrench helps you unstick a bolt, uh, it kind of augments your human strength. You can think of AI as augmenting your human intelligence. And it's just a tool and we should keep it centered there. And in, in fact, we, we were um, attending the World Economic Forum in Davos, and we happened to have lots of our customers. I think we went through 60 or 70 meetings in, a, in the space of about three days. Every meeting started with the CEO or whoever was on the other side of the table saying, what do I do about AI? Tell me about AI. What do I need to know? And essentially, we came back to, you know, it is a tool. It's a tool that can help you. It can help you in your um, ability to gain insights from your data. But it's not magic fairy dust, right? You can't just uh, sprinkle it across your business and, and think things will grow. Um, and that's, I think we have to get a little grounded there. It can do a lot of good, yeah. and we just have to deploy responsibly. Um, it is a tool. It does have human implications. We saw that in Arizona yesterday with the Uber car. We were talking about that earlier with Tony. Um, what lessons can you take from that, either from the Uber side of it or from just in general sort of self-driving or AI deployment on how you can protect against that kind of just sort of fatal loss of life or, or bad, um, bad results, and how you can respond as a company when, when something like that happens. Right, so first it was, that was just a tragic accident and my heart goes out to that family involved. Um, but I think first and foremost, Uber did the right thing by stopping it. They said, okay, all of this is halted, we need to understand what happened here, 
And um, that's the right thing to do. Anytime we have a technology, um, we have to deploy very, very carefully. And I, I'm not close enough to the situation to know what exactly happened, but immediately stopping it is the right thing to do. And just as um, a, an analogy, we had something similar happen to us. Uh, it didn't involve uh, harm to humans, but it did involve, um, it was, there was an empathetic problem that we had. And essentially, we had introduced a chatbot called Tay. And we were using it to try and understand how natural language input um, could look inside of an application. So it was really, it, it was kind of a tool that we were learning with, but we'd done something kind of fun with it. We'd created this persona of a young, uh, I think she was 19, 20 year old young woman, and she was kind of hip, um, but she was all driven by an AI algorithm. And what we did is uh, we just want to understand how humans would interact. So you could ask a question using um, just sort of your normal language, like we're talking here right now, and Tay would respond. And uh, so we, we put it up on Twitter, and um, very quickly, within hours, uh, the small group of people had targeted Tay, realized Tay could learn, and trained her to be racist. And immediately, it of course caught our attention, and we, we brought it down immediately. We didn't know what had happened exactly, but we said, this is hurting people, this is offensive. And we came back to that core of, of empathy. This is, this is hurting our users, it's hurting our employees, we're taking it down. And so we took it down and we went back through and kind of analyzed everything. But I, I, I wanna just share a story that happened the next day, it's, it's very interesting. The team that had worked on it is just a brilliant team of scientists. They're, they're very deep in natural language processing, um, just an incredible team that we had internally. Now you can imagine how they felt. They were um, demoralized. They thought, what, what happened here you know, th their, to their uh, product that they'd worked so hard on? And um, I, again, Satya, our, our CEO, uh, sent them an email and he said, look, first of all, we did the right thing. Um, we were offending people, we took it down. But I want you to know, let's, let's use this as a learning moment. Let's not shelve this technology because the technology is very, very good. You can imagine it could be answering questions for maybe elderly people who are homebound and, and giving them um, real world answers to their questions. That's the sort of thing we wanna continue to promote. And he said, let's just do a reset. Let's work to understand what went wrong, but know that I have your back. Know that you've done a good thing with this technology and we're gonna keep going. So I think it's important to respond quickly, to respond with empathy if something happens, um, to hopefully ensure that, that you don't get to that point, but if you do, to take, it, take things off the air as quickly as possible. Um, but not to shelve things. I think it's very important because these are tools that can help us solve things like eradicating diseases and finding solutions for poverty, climate change. We don't want to stop that kind of progress. Yeah, and Tay is an interesting example and it was sort of early in the process and we're still seeing it now even with um, YouTube elevating a video suggesting some of the kids in Parkland were crisis actors to the top of their trending list. That was sort of a limited use of algorithm, but it was a case where a small number of, a seemingly small number of bad actors um, were able to use a technology for ill. Is there a way, I mean, is there a way that the engineers can be protecting against that kind of misuse of the platform in the, in the first place? Yeah, and I think the way is to assume that this will happen <laughs> and then work back from there. Um, which is why we were pleased to, um, it started with Satya's set of principles around AI, but now with Future Computed, we've gone deeper on that. You have to have these conversations. You can't just build a technology in your lab and unleash it on the world. That's not being responsible. Um, you really want to take the proper steps to ensure that the technology will be used for good and to assume ways that it might not be and work back from there. So we, we, we try to instill that in our engineers on these development teams that they, again, come from a sense of empathy. What might go wrong? Let me work back from there so I can prohibit it. And by the way, Tay was relaunched as Zoe 
um, also a young woman, uh, on the kick platform and it has the proper safeguards in place and we haven't had any incidents since then. But it, it taught us, it trained us <laughs> to, to understand sort of the limits of the technology and where humans have to get involved to keep things on the rails. Mm -hmm, right. Um, you mentioned some of the good use cases of AI, probably that people don't know that much about. And I was reminded this morning seeing the picture of Jeff Bezos with the Boston Dynamics robot oh, yeah. dog that I feel like is probably the most overexposed, over photographed <laughs> robot of the modern era. What um, uses of the technology are um, being o overlooked and which ones are, are being sort of overexposed in that way? We're, we're thinking about too much. Right, so there is, there are already several uh, applications of AI, uh, even, even for instance, the mapping on your phones, that's an underlying application of, of AI that I think probably most of you really uh, appreciate. <laughs> I know I do whenever I'm walking around a new city. Um, so there, there are already many use cases out there. A few of them um, that I, I'd love to highlight, uh, we just released an app called Scene AI. And it uses AI for image recognition for um, blind or low vision uh, impaired people who can take their phone with them and now it sort of gives them some freedom. Um, they, can, they can read currency. Um, we've had r reports of uh, folks going into grocery stores and finding the right spices for the first time. We had a great uh, story from a young woman who said you know, she was able to cook dinner that night having shopped on her own. And so it's, it's opening up doors for people who previously had to maybe rely on another human. Now they can be augmented by this AI. I think that one is just, it's just a small use case but to a lot of people, it, it's a very, very important, very freeing uh, opportunity to be able to use that. Um, another one that we were involved in recently is with uh, adaptive biotechnologies. They are looking, their end game is actually to be able to find a, uh, to be able to develop a universal blood test to uh, map the auto, or to map your immune system, which you can imagine then could be used for things like autoimmune diseases, or early detection of cancer. And the reason that this uh, partnership came together is they're the experts in this area in um, studying the immune mapping of, of humans. The problem is it's a lot of data. It's just massive, massive amounts of data. And if you have to rely um, sort of just on, on your standard algorithms, you, it, it'll take too long to come to a, the conclusion that they want, which is this universal blood test. So we teamed up with them and we are helping them sort through that data using AI and um, that work is underway. And I think it'll be very important work eventually because the idea with this early blood test is early, de or with the blood test is early detection of uh, cancers and trying to understand autoimmune diseases which are very, very complex. And I think it'll give us some insights in there that we haven't been able to see without having this AI in place. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think this is all we've got time for. Last sort of question, where do you think we're going to be paying attention to these AI stories in the next year, five years? What, what should we be looking for? Well, I do think, as, as the last story uh, just told, I do think healthcare is an area. I think it's areas that have a lot of data. Um, those are the areas that now that we can access them and reason across them, we're going to see some impact. So healthcare, I think in the financial services area, I think in areas like climate change, we have massive amounts of data and we just need the ability to sort through that and AI is gonna be a tool that'll allow us to do that. That's good. All right, well thank you everybody for joining us. Um, next I'd like to uh, uh, welcome my colleague Anna Rothschild. This has been Peggy Johnson, thanks so much. Thank you.